Okay, uh, so today we'll have very unusual and interesting lecture. Uh, Ilya, well, we know each other for several years now. Uh, we introduced by a friend and uh, he actually made, God knows how many millions of dollars or tens of hundreds of millions of dollars for I his wish. clients. Come on. Oh, 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 for the clients. <laughs> for the clients, yes, for the clients. And um, so he is doing uh, financial analytics uh and uh, designing strategies for his clients he works mostly in r although he also knows python and uh, you have masters in uh, statistics i think yes. right yes right and a lot of uh, real life actual experience working with uh, financial data so you have the floor <laughs> okay so this is about using r uh, which is a statistical programming language uh, for doing research with asset management. Now, in finance, the idea is you have some money and by deploying it and redeploying it, uh, you can make more money uh, just by being smart with how you invest your money. Uh, and ultimately, there are two forces at play, which is uh, the reward, how much money you make versus risk, how much money you stand to lose. Uh, so lately the environment has not been good for almost anything. Uh, but basically the idea is that you can use R to simulate how you'd make certain decisions uh, based purely on quantitative data. And even though some people like to invest their own money by saying, I like this company's management, I believe in this company's mission, blah, 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 blah. Uh, this is not what we're working with when we do quantitative finance. Uh, what we work with is saying, how have these assets behaved over some period of time? And based on that actual objective data, we are going to tell the computer what to do. Uh, that way there can be no... Uh, no room for judgment if someone would have liked the model on any given day, yes or no, or they would have made an investment decision uh, because the, the, sky, the sky was good, the weather was good, it was a sunny day, so they decide to buy some stocks, or the weather was bad and they decide not to. You can't simulate that, right? So the benefits of using a computer to simulate back-tested data, uh, to simulate data that happened is that you could say with exact certainty how your strategy, how the strategy would have performed. Uh, of course, there are all the risks with everything else, as with everything else in data science, that you overfit your model, uh, but we're not going to touch on that uh, today. So with R to really uh, start doing research, you need three libraries, which are XTS, Performance Analytics, and QuantMod. And the way to install them is uh, to write... Uh, in, so let, let me actually just um, uh, close uh, or, or rather sweep the console here. So uh, you do something like install packages uh, XTS. I have uh, XTS already installed, so I don't need to do this. Uh, let me get that out of the way. Um, and so you do this for XTS. Uh, you would do this then uh, for uh, quant for performance analytics, and you do this for quant mod. Uh, you could also do this for TTR, uh, which is also a prerequisite for for one of these packages, if I recall correctly. But th these are your basic building blocks of doing uh, the, your basic libraries of doing quantitative finance in R. It isn't the base programming language that does the quantitative finance research. It's these libraries that are built by it, practitioners more experienced than myself, much more uh, experienced. And they have special functions uh, to, to do this financial research. It's no different than base Python not doing data science, but needing NumPy and Pandas and Scikit-Learn and Matplotlib and whatever else. So one of the really good things about XTS is that in, in base R, if you try to column bind two vectors of different lengths, it, this is going to fail. So we have one vector of length three, one vector of length two, and we're going to try and bind them together. And as you can see, uh, warning message, 
uh, the the number of rows is not a multiplier. So, uh, so what we we don't really get what we expect, which is something like one, two, three, and then this should and and then th this should be an NA or that should be an NA, right? But if we get two different stocks uh, from Yahoo, such as SPY, which is the S&P 500, it's the oldest ETF in existence, and TSLA, which is Tesla Motors. Uh, so very interesting company. Uh, say what you will about Elon Musk, right? But we can see that Tesla starts, uh, it went public in, in 2010, uh, 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 June 29th, 2000, uh, 2010, right? And SPY, SPY, it has existed since, uh, since 1993. So what happens when we try and, and bind them together? Well, this succeeds. And why does it succeed? Because when you put them together, you can see that it binds them by date. The, the index is the, the dates here. So when it combines them, it says, well, Tesla doesn't have any, any data before uh, June 29th. So we're just going to put NA. But we're not going to fail uh, the operation. Because, of course, when you put together two instruments that start on different dates, uh, then one just didn't have data, and that's fine, right? So let's, let's get uh, SPY and TLT and combine them. And we can use the, commit, the command NA omit to, to remove all observations with one or more NAs in them. So let's do a head on returns. And you can see that this starts now in 2002. Uh, this starts basically in August of 2002 instead of 1993 because TLT uh, only started back then. So, Ilya, Ilya, sorry. Yeah. Uh, where did you get the data from? How you loaded it? Uh, it oh, it, so the get symbols command, it defaults to Yahoo Finance. So Yahoo Finance is a free uh, service. The data quality isn't that great, uh, but it's, it's generally fine when you're doing adjusted prices on ETFs. Uh, so the big issue with Yahoo Finance is that it doesn't have delisted companies. So if you would try to get the data for say Lehman Brothers, which went bankrupt in 2008, uh, then you wouldn't be able to get it. For example, if I do get symbols LEH, uh, download failed. That was the, the ticker for Lehman Brothers, right? So download and, failed. Uh, get symbols is in which library? It's in quant mod. Oh, okay. So when you when you type a, a a function name, it'll tell you the environment is in namespace quant mod. In names the namespace is the package that it's in. Okay. And C bind is where? Uh, so so C bind uh XTS dot uh C bind dot XTS is is an XTS. So when when I say C bind, it says, hey, these two objects are XTS objects. So like if I do class of spy, it's an XTS zoo object. Uh, so you have things like vectors, data frames, matrices. XTS is another type of object, which allows it to use different functions such as uh, C bind dot XTS. And this uh, is- uh, in Do you know what XTS stands for? Extensible time series. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So another feature of XTS objects is that we can subset them by date. So if we want to want to look at returns from January 1st of 2008 to February 28th of 2008, we can do that. So here you can see me issuing this command and, and you have two months of daily returns data which is just today's price divided by yesterday's price minus one. You know, if I have $100 today, but yesterday I had, you know, $105, I lost, you know, 5%, right? Uh, or rather, if, if I have $95 today and yesterday I had $100, I lost uh, 5%. So uh, here is our first basic strategy, which is what is commonly known as the 60-40 portfolio, which is you have 60% of your money in stocks, 40% of your money in bonds, uh, which is TLT in this case. And every month on the last day of the month, you just rebalance it 
uh, at the close of trading, which is four o'clock Eastern time. So if you had say, so if you had $10,000, you want it to be 6,000 in stocks, 4,000 in bonds. And if at the end of the month, uh, so if the, at the end of next month, you have something like, I don't know, uh, $10,000 in stocks and, and $5,000 in bonds, uh, that's $15,000 total, then you're going to, you're going to rebalance that portfolio. You're going to sell, sell some of the stocks and, and put that money uh, into bonds uh, until you have 9,000 in stocks and uh, 6,000 in, in, um, in bonds, right? So this is, you know, to simulate that strategy, there's, it's literally one line. It's return dot portfolio. R is your return series. So returns are what we defined up here with the return dot calculate command. So return dot calculate on AD of SPY means I calculate simple returns on, on the adjusted column of SPY. So that's what this is, right? So the first strat, first strategy, literally one line, right? So if you look at first strat, you will see the portfolio returns of the strategy. And we can do something like display its performance. So if I just move this, uh, this Skype, this Zoom meeting out, out of the way, you could see how it would have performed since 2002. You just see this, this line, this is your total wealth starting from essentially $1. Uh, it's just indexed to zero because this is tracking the percent changes. So $1 would basically become $6 uh, over a course of about you know, 20 years, right? And we can uh, do some statistics on it. So table.annualized returns means about how much money on average are you making per year? So annualized return means if you always keep reinvesting your profits, so if, if I go, if I have $10,000 one year and $15,000 at the start of next year, I keep doing my, I don't take out the $5,000 I made in profit. I, I now have $15,000 and invest that $15,000. So that's what these three numbers say. The annualized return is basically like, it's, it's analogous to a mean in, in data science. Like if you roll, if you, the mean of rolling a dice, is 3.5. One plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six divide divide by six is 3.5. Uh, and this is the 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 nth root of the geometric product of daily returns. Uh, the annualized standard deviation, it's literally the standard deviation of of all of these of all of these returns. So what is the dimension of that? It's it's 4,958 trading days, right? So this is the standard deviation of the annualized standard deviation of all these. It's taking the standard deviation and multiplying it by the square root of 252 because there are 252 trading days. And then we have uh, this number called max drawdown, which is basically saying, what is the most amount, amount of money I lost in the simulation? Uh, the idea being, if I have $100 today, I make $50, $50 and I go to $150. And then the next day I lose 50% and go to $75. That means I lost 50% uh, because I went from $150 to $75 uh, as my biggest uh, peak to trough loss. So, so as you can see, the biggest drawdown occurs somewhere around here in 2008, 2009. Uh, and that's basically saying you had this much money here and then you lost a bunch of money and then you, you, kept, you, know, you made money and then you lost money around here. This is March of 2020 of the coronavirus. Uh, and then the comma ratio is the ratio of the annualized return, how much money we make, this strategy makes on average per year divide by how much total money did it lose in percentage terms. Basically, the way I like to interpret this is uh, one divide by the comma ratio of the, of the strategy 
is how long, it, how many years it would take to make up your biggest loss. So those are the, are the, are the main uh, metrics I, I pay attention to because how much you stand to gain per year, what's your biggest loss. Uh, and and that, that's a pretty good indication of what the risk of the strategy is, in my opinion. Because if a strategy says, hey, this strategy lost 55%, uh, then can you really stay in that strategy? You know, are you okay with losing? You know, the, if, if you put $100,000 into a strategy and the maximum drawdown is 55%, are you okay with the idea of losing $55,000? Uh, you know, some people might say, sure, you know, this is play money. I could afford to lose it. Other people say, these are my life savings. I can't afford to lose. So. Uh, yeah. How this strategy compares uh, with the market, with the whole market? Uh, okay. So this is, so, it, uh, okay. So what we can do is say compare is an omit C bind first strat and return.calc ad spot, right? And then we can literally uh, chart a comparison and then do the same thing, right? So right. this is the market, SPY adjusted, and this is the strategy. So this ratio, uh, annualized sharp, is the return divided by the annualized standard yield. So I don't really like that because I don't like standard deviation as a as a measure as the measure of risk because it really doesn't say uh, it doesn't give a good indication of just how bad things will get. Uh, I, you know I like you know the comma ratio better, uh, and we can find that as well. So comma ratio. So on a risk return perspective, uh, the strategy performs better. But on a, on a total return uh, perspective, uh, pure stocks perform better. So basically- uh, Your portfolio is SPY and Tesla, right? Uh, no, this is SPY and TLT. Oh, because if you look at Tesla, it should be probably much higher. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, Tesla is much higher uh, though. You know, the, these days, not so much. I'm, I'm invested in it and it's- you know, it's just been chopping around. Uh, Can you also compare it on the same graph just to see how it looks? Uh, okay, so um, compare is I know uh, I know mit c bind compare and return dot calc ad Tesla, and then we 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 um you know there's Tesla in green and just blows both of these away. <laughs> wow. But, but yeah, you know, it's a lot riskier. So uh, table dot annualized return compare. Uh, and yeah, you know, if you held Tesla from moment one, uh, your, uh, you know, your, 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 you made a lot of money. Uh, so if we look at the max drawdown, uh, you know, since, since, you know, Tesla went public, it had a maximum drawdown of 60% as well. So no free lunch, as you can see down here, you know, in the, in the depths of the coronavirus, actually, you know, Tesla lost 60%. So, you know, you, you would have been great if you could buy it. Um, no, I don't, I don't think that's, that's that. Uh, no, this was sometime in 2018, I think. But yeah, right here, Tesla lost 60%. So, you know, high risk stock, but, you know, uh, the, the reward is there, you know, if, if you can hold it. But what's interesting is that it made most of the money, you know, sit, you know, over the past couple of years, essentially. Great. But but yeah, you know, that, that that's the dream. You know, if if you can uh, develop a strategy for extremely high volatility uh, stocks, then you you can stand to make a lot of money, and I mean a lot of money. Uh, you know, when working with ETFs uh, using tactical asset allocation universes, there's no such luck. And, you know, here I'll, I'll demonstrate the basic tactical asset allocation strategy. So tactical asset allocation is the idea that you use momentum 
which is some people have called the premier market anomaly, combined with some form of diversification, which is the idea that in finance, it, you know, predictions are not absolutely correct, that the company that made the most money today might crash and burn tomorrow. So if you think about a company like, say, Enron or Lehman Brothers or companies that have gone bankrupt because of bad accounting, or an, another name some of you may have heard, Theranos, right? Uh, you know, completely fraudulent company. Uh, the CEO, Elizabeth Holmes, just hyped it up a lot and people thought they had a real product and so on and so forth. As it turned out, the company was completely worthless, right? So just because a company takes off one day doesn't mean it's going to be around the next, which is why in finance, the only quote unquote free lunch is spreading your bets, uh, which, you know, ag again, even that's not a free lunch because you move away from what could be the best company uh, and you spread your bets away from it, right? So in this case, we're going to use eight assets, SPY, which is uh, the S&P 500, TLT, which are long-term bonds, IEF, uh, medium-term bonds, GLD, which is the ETF for gold, DBC, this is a basket of commodities uh, whose price has been rising uh, you know, recently because of Putin's invasion of Ukraine. And then uh, EEM, emerging markets, EWJ, these are Japanese equities, EFA, which is Europe, uh, Asia, and far, uh, far East, which is basically developed markets without the United States and Canada, right? So this is our, our universe. It's one of the three components of tactical asset allocation, which is what are the assets you actually put in your universe? Uh, how, do you, how do you select them? And then how do you diversify, right? Uh, there are, you know, th there's a whole sea of ideas for how you possibly uh, diversify, how you rebalance and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, I've been doing this, you know, for quite a few years. And, uh, uh, you know, a company I consult for, it's, it's literally managing tens of millions of dollars uh, of an algorithm based on, an, on such an algorithm that I co-wrote. Uh, it's called Momentum and Markowitz, uh, the, the golden uh, a golden combination. It's one of the most downloaded papers on SSRN. So if you want to Google that up, feel free. But again, what we do here is we get the, we get the data from Yahoo. So we loop through the symbol names. Uh, these are our symbols. Uh, and then we, we append them in an empty list. So we initialize a list. It's like initializing an empty, an empty array in your object-oriented programming languages. And for each name, we're just going to append the adjusted returns uh, to, to, th to this list called returns. And then we're going to bind them together and, and remove any observations with NAs. So we start at the, when, when the data for the last one of these begins. So we highlight that, we press enter, a uh, control enter. And then the result is this. Uh, so this is, a, this is head. Uh, in, in Python, you have something like returns.head. In R, it's just head returns. And these are the first six observations. They start in 2006. Now, here is a very fundamental function when doing time series analysis uh, for asset allocation strategies. This is called endpoints. And what this does is it gets the last day of a certain subset of time. So the default here is uh, months. So on equals months, uh, K equals one, which means I want to get the last day of every set of one month intervals. Uh, so if I made this two, this would be give me the last day of every two months a and so on. So what is EP? It's this vector of, of indices that say, these are the dates of, your, of the last day of each month in the data. So if we look at returns subset of the of this of the endpoints index to the endpoints what we see is that it gives us the last day of each the last trading day of each month so here we see uh september 
2014, uh, October 31st, 2014, November 28th, 2014, 2014, and so on. So very, very fundamental uh, function there. Uh, and before I start to go into the strategy, uh, does anybody have any questions? Because I'm pretty sure I went pretty quickly here. So uh, I, have, is... I have one question. Sorry. Left yeah, yeah, go. Um, so this is R, obviously. Do you have experience doing the same things in Python? Or if not, could you recommend any libraries that do similar things in Python? So here's the thing. When I was trying to find libraries to do this in Python, I couldn't. So uh, to, okay. to, to give you the idea of my uh, frustration, the, uh, so this, this function, return.portfolio, to my knowledge, it does not exist in Python. It just doesn't okay. exist. I was Googling okay. for it, so. Okay. Well, got to learn R then, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. That, 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 that's why I've been using it. I, uh, you know, uh, it, it's in the plans for me. You know, I, I, I've wanted to say, hey, let me just port this function over into Python, and then I can do asset allocation in Python. But I just haven't gotten around to it because, you know, it's it's a bit of work. Uh, you know, All it's right. a bit of thing. Okay, anybody else? Okay, if not, then moving on. So essentially, we start off with an empty list of weights. So every, every month, we're going to change the weights in our portfolio. Usually, they sum up to one. Sometimes, they'll be less than one. Uh, most of the time, they're not going to be more than one uh, because weights being more than one means the strategy is borrowing money. So you can't really do that in a, a tax-free retirement account. Like on E-Trade, I said, hey, can I get leverage for my strategy? And they said, no. So that means you have to actually use leveraged instruments, which is fine. But uh, you know that that that's that's uh, you know that that's just a bit of real world uh, issues. So what? So one of the key features of an asset allocation strategy is a look back, because when we do a simulation, we loop through a chunk, through a subset, uh, through a chunk of time. All right. So when we do our calculations, we want to say, hey. Uh, you know, we want to know how how much did stocks go, did these assets go up by? But when you say, how much did these assets go up by? That's an incomplete question because the complete question is, how much did these assets go up by over the past one month, two months, three months, six months, and so on, right? Uh, because for example, if you look at say Tesla, uh, so if you just look at this graph, if you say, well, did Tesla go up over the past five years? Yes, absolutely. But did Tesla go up over the past three months, which is just this upper right-hand corner? No, no, it didn't, right? So when you say, did, they, did these assets go up? Well, the question is over how much time did these assets go up, right? Uh, the next parameter is top N, which is uh, how many assets do we want to hold uh, every period? Uh, and in this case, uh, I, I, just, I just said, okay, the, it's going to be a floor of the number of columns in our asset universe, which is uh, eight assets. So this is going to be four, if I'm correct. Right, so it's the floor of the number of columns in the returns divided by two. So we want to hold about 50% of the universe every single rebalancing period, which is every month. So this is just setting up an, an empty weight vector because we are going to copy this, uh, this empty weight vector whenever we do our rebalancing. And that is going to look like, uh, it's, it's gonna look like this. It's just a bunch of zeros uh, with the, the names of, of the assets. And now this is the, the skeleton of the strategy. So for every subset of, of periods, which goes from, uh, which is indexed from one to the length of EP, which is again every single index of of the endpoints of months uh, minus our look back. Uh, 
So our look back is six months. So oh, why do we do this? Because the subset is going to be uh, the epi, uh, you know, the returns indexed on the endpoints of i, in this case, i starts at one, plus one, which means the next day. So uh, ep i of one plus one is going to be one because e our first ep is zero. So we add one to that. Uh, and then if we do this for, and then if we plug in two, we're going to have 16. So one, 16, 39, and so on. Because uh, the uh, EP is the last day of a month. And what we want to do when we're using returns is start at the first day of the month. And then we go all the way to ep, EP of I plus look back. So if, when I is one and look back is six, and this is going to be, we go from one to EP of, uh, so from one to 121, which is approximately six months of trading data, uh, which we use to look back over. So what we do here, uh, so let's just set I equal to one to demonstrate, you know, a walkthrough of one of these instances, right? We, okay. Look back, I didn't define it yet because I didn't run that. So we take our subset. So this is our, our subset. It's an n by eight. So it's an n by p matrix of returns data, uh, which is the n is how many days, the p is how many assets. So if we look at the dimensions of the subset, which is the same thing as you know subset dot shape in in uh, Python, we get 121 days and eight assets, right? So then we compute the momentums by just saying return dot cumulative. Uh, if you're using price data, this would literally just be the price of the last day divided by the uh, price of the first day minus one. And that looks like this. It's, it's a series of, of momentums, momentum estimates. And remember, these are past performances. So this is the calculation of momentum up to the last day in the subset, or the, on the day of which we make our decision. And we use the calculation for momentum as a proxy for our prediction as to which assets will appreciate in the coming rebalancing period, which in this case is one month. So in this case, I'm going to say that our selected assets are so our, so we're going to rank them. And in R, uh, the highest rank is towards the highest value. So if you were to rank, say, rank, say, um, see, 10, 4, 2, 1, uh, then, it, you know, 10 is the highest number in this vector. But in ranking, it ranks it fourth. Uh, so R ranks by, you know, by absolute values uh, and says the lowest gets the lowest rank. So we want to rank negative momentum. So what do these look like? It looks like this, uh, you know, it, it ranks, it says, well, you know, gold is, you know, appreciated the most. So it gets rank one, uh, spy is rank four and so on. And the way we, we select these assets is a double, is a logical of two different conditions. First, I want to say that the ranks are less than or equal to our top N. So remember that I said I wanted to select the top four assets every single month. But also, I want to make sure that the momentums are actually above zero. So when times are really bad and all assets are falling, then what I'm saying is if every asset falls, then do not invest money into any asset just stay in cash, right? So what I'm going to say here, and this is a quick logical to make sure that when the sum of all the assets is zero, that means we're not investing anything. We're just going to take, uh, we're just going to say our weight for that period is, you know, is this. It's just the zero vector. Otherwise, 
and we are going to so we're going to say that our selected subset is the subset of the on the assets that we selected. Uh, so, oops. So what is selected assets? It's saying, which four assets are we going to invest in this period, which is SPY, GLD, DBC, and EFA. And does that actually check out? Well, EFA is positive, uh, SPY is positive, GLD and DBC are positive, and the other four are negative. So it all, you know, just, just this condition checks out. Uh, but if, you know, if there were five or more that were positive, this condition would narrow down the universe uh, for that period as well. So what is a selected subset? It's just the same returns, but only for these four assets, all right? So how do we, how do we diversify? That is, we know which assets we are going to be investing in, in this period, but then how do we spread our bets? Well, you know, this is where the rabbit hole runs really deep because there are a number of different ways you can do it. The most, the easiest one is just say, okay, we selected four assets. We're going to put our money equally in four assets. So we could just say 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, right? Uh, in this case, I decide to do something a little more complicated, which is to just take the standard deviation of, of every single asset for this period take their inverse and then and then take the normal uh, the normalized sum uh, of these in inverse uh, standard deviations so the bigger your standard the bigger the asset standard deviation in this period the smaller of an allocation is going to get so if we look at uh, SD devs uh, let's just multiply it by square root of 252 because it's daily data so you can see that spy had about an 11% standard deviation, gold had 28%, DBC had 20%, and EFA had 18%. So do, uh, does the weight here uh, actually uh, match up how we think it would? Yeah. So SPY, we have 38% of our holdings. Gold, we have 15, uh, 15, uh, you know, 16%. Uh, DBC, we have 21%. And EFA, we have about 25%. And does this make sense? Uh, well, yes, because SPY in this in in this six month subset has about you know one you know one third one half one half to one third of the volatility of GLD, and you can see that reflected in in this weight. And if we do a sum of weight, it's going to be one, right? So now, how do we get this? How do we go from this? Uh, four asset selection into an eight asset selection to tell R that, hey, we, we didn't forget about the other assets. We're just not investing in them this period. We say empty back is, a, you know, is temp weight. This is a pass by value, not a pass by reference uh, command. Uh, in R, everything is pass by value unless you explicitly tell it, uh, tell it not to. Uh, and then, so then empty VEC is just this set of zeros. And then we say, and then using the column names of our selected assets. So, so these are the column names of the weight. It's just going to be the weight. And now what does this look like? Now it actually plugs in the weights, right? So then we say weight is the empty vec just to keep our ducks in a row. But we're not done yet because what uh, this weight, it's a data frame. Notice that its index is just one. Uh, so this is a weight, yes, but when uh, did you assign this weight, right? So what we do is say, this is an XTS and we order it by the last index of the subset. And that is just a date. That is just 2006-0731. And when we do tail of subset, it's the last day of the subset for that period. And then we just assign it to the, to the list of weights we already defined up here. Is everyone still following? Yes, very interesting. Okay, so after we do all that, 
we, we combine all the weights in an R bind. So C bind means column bind. We have, so when we combine asset, you know, asset returns, we say, you know, we have one, we have one, uh, one asset, uh, such as spy, and then we, we, we combine it with TLT, which is its own universe. And so, and then we combine it with, and then, we, you know, we, we, when we were making our returns, we just had eight assets and we column binded them, which essentially means in XTS, it means you, you combine it, you combine by all the dates, right? But when we do, uh, when, when we're doing back testing in tactical asset allocation, uh, or, or rather we combine, so C bind is basically you combine by asset. You have a group of assets and you, and you combine them into one data frame by, by merging all the, each individual asset vector uh, or each individual asset column, right? So, but when we do tactical asset allocation, we, we have dates of weights. We have row vectors of weights that are indexed by date. So when we combine those, we do it with it. We do it by row binding as opposed to column binding. So then after we loop through everything, we just let this run. It's going to take, you know, literally takes less than a second to simulate this. We are going to calculate the returns of our strategy. And you'll notice I use lag a couple of times. This is to simulate the fact that you do not get the data immediately when doing tactical asset allocation, but rather, you know, it's going, you'll say, what is the performance of these assets through, you know, March 31st, but you'll only get that data on April 1st. So you will uh, actually invest your money at the close of April 1st, as opposed to the close of, April, of March 31st. Uh, you know, it, it, when you get this wrong, you can have optimistic results uh, and you don't want, that. Be, uh, you know, so return.portfolio, it takes care of the fact that it's not going to give you the return of time T because the return of time T is, you know, the, so like the return of Monday is Monday's closing price divided by, uh, you know, Friday's closing price. So if you invest your money at the close of Monday, well, you can't go back in time and buy the, the assets on Friday. Otherwise, you know, if you had a time machine, we don't, you know, if anyone had a time machine, they'd be, you know, a trillionaire or more, right? Nobody has one. That's why, that's why the industry exists. So uh, what we do here is we say we have a data frame. We have an XTS of weights, which looks like this, right? It's a bunch of weights. And then we have a bunch of returns. So that looks like this. So again, we use the return.portfolio function and we, we plug in uh, the lag returns negative one. When we're saying negative one, we're saying give, a, give me the future return because if I make a decision on time T, I want to know, you know, I want the returns from time T plus one. Uh, and R, when you say in, in XTS, when you say lag, it's a, you know, lag means what was the data yesterday, at least in XTS, in dplyr R, it goes the other way. So whenever you're doing this, this research, you always have to make sure to, uh, uh, you know, detach package dplyr R to, uh, you know, if it's loaded, otherwise you're going to get problems. Uh, so your R is, uh, so R, your returns is lag returns minus one. Your weights, uh, so the weights argument is the weights XTS. So head of weight. So if it looks confusing, this is because uh, when you look at the argument arguments for return dot portfolio, uh, one of the weights, one of the arguments is called weights, uh, and also one of and and also the object I passed in as as the weights is also called weights. So when you see weights equals weights, uh, then that means that, you know, the, the weights for the strategy come from an object called weights. And verbose equals true means you get some other data from this strategy, right? So let's just compute uh, how well the strategy was done. So in return.portfolio, NA is detected, filling NA is zeros. It probably means we had some, uh, so, 
some of these returns were probably NAs uh, or head of weights. Sum is nay weights. Okay, I don't know why why it's it's uh, doing this, uh, but it, it, usually this this warning is, is fine. It, it just means you probably had some 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 dates that you had uh, no uh, you know a, a total weight of zero. And in return dot portfolio geometric, the weights for one or more periods do not sum up to one. Assuming a return of zero for the residual weights, this is okay because uh, let's just plot. Uh, plot row sums of weights. This is not a, this is not an XTS, which is why you see, you know, an X axis of index, you know, an index of just integers. But as you can see on some dates, uh, you know, it just held nothing because everything was, you know, had negative returns, right? So we can now chart the strategy's performance as we did with our first strategy. So, you know, this is what, it, you know, this is what your wealth index would have looked like from 2006, you know, usually goes up, but sometimes it does take that dip. Uh, and you can compute the same statistics, uh, which is, you know, these are, you know, this is how you, much money you make per year. Uh, you know, these, this is your average annual return. This is your standard deviation. This is your sharp ratio, which is just the ratio of this number, this number. Generally, if you have a sharp ratio of one or higher, you're doing very well. Uh, so uh, the sharp ratio, to put it into data science terms, it's like a, a z-score, essentially, in, uh, for, for, you know, are you making money or not? So uh, consider your annualized return, your mean, your, standard, your annualized standard deviation as the standard deviation. So we all know how, the z, how a z-score is computed. Uh, but in this case, you know, if there's a risk for your rate, which I usually assume is zero because these days rates are near zero. Uh, so if you put your money into a savings account, uh, you'd get what, you know, 25% of 1%, you know, it's basically zero. So that's, you know, your sharp ratio. It's X bar minus mu divided by stigma, right? Uh, so we can look at the max drawdown, uh, which is 17%. And we can take the comma ratio, which is uh, 49%. Uh, how does that do? Um, so table that annualized. Um, let's just com compare it to 60-40. So on a comma ratio perspective, this actually outperforms the 60-40. Uh, uh, on the sharp ratio perspective, well, the 60-40 had more time. So it's sharp ratio is a bit better. Uh, but also what we can do is compute something known as the turnover because every single month, if you're in a taxable account, you're going to have to sell some stocks. You're going to have to buy other stocks. And this is why we use this verbose equals true argument. And what we do here say, what we do here is say, the turnover is known as your beginning of period weight divided by your yesterday's ending weight. So, you know, if yesterday at the end of close, you were going into the close with say 50% of your assets in stock A and 50% of your assets in stock B. And then, and then at the begin, beginning of next day, you had 50% of your assets in stock C and 50% of your assets in stock D. Well, you had to sell, sell all of stock A and B and buy all of C and D. So that would give you a 200% turnover, right? So we can actually compute this. Uh, and turn it into an XTS, and we can plot the turnover. So as you can see, some days, you know, you'd have a turnover of 200%, right? Like the, these, these two months, uh, it said, sell all four assets you're currently holding and buy the other four assets. Happens, you know, you know n sometimes actually, but 200% turnover, if you're an institution, your clients wouldn't like that hey, one month you just decided to sell all your assets and then, and then buy completely new assets. And then basically a month later, you did the same thing. They'd be saying, what are you doing, right? But you know, again, this is a toy example. In, at the firm I'm consulting for, there are actual you know, tricks you can do to minimize this, uh, to lower this turnover. But again, toy example. And you know, this just uh, plots the turnover, right? And that actually 
comes to the end of my example. You know, it's like that was a basic tactical asset allocation strategy. What we did, you know, we did three important things. One, we defined our universe. Uh, you know, I'll write it here on the screen. Uh, one, uh, define universe. Uh, or two, we defined our defined parameters. Uh, three, uh, rebalanced uh, selected assets every rebalanced period. And four, uh, diversified assets, diversified selected assets every rebalance period, right? So, you know, all of these, all these different steps, you know, have a multitude of different ways you can go about, you know, what is the correct answer? Well, the correct answer is whatever, you know, even, you know, how you measure what the correct answer is, can be debated, you know, is this a strategy that makes the most money? Is it the most, is it the strategy that makes the most money per unit of risk? Uh, and if you're talking about per unit of risk, well, how do you define your unit of risk? Do you use Sharpe ratio? Do you, you know, which is the annualized, you know, the annualized return divided by the annualized standard deviation. Do you use the comma ratio, which is your annualized return divided by your, your max loss in percentage terms? Uh, there are some other, uh, you know, th there are some other terms, uh, other metrics as well. And all of these essentially have a, you know, no real, no objectively correct way to do, to do this, but some are better than others, right? So that's ultimately what a tactical asset allocation strategy is. And it's a valid style of investing if you don't mind the turnover, all right? Uh, you know, but if you're really squeamish about, you know, if you're really sensitive to taxes, then, you know, you need like a buy and hold uh, portfolio. Uh, and that's just the nature of the beast, right? So that's my presentation. That's my tutorial. And once again, I'm opening the floor up to questions. Well, this was really, really good. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Uh, if you want actually to run it automatically, uh, will you automate in, in R or you will rewrite it in Python? Like how it works so, in practice? So, so in practice, uh, it will give you the weights, but I don't know of a way to get the computer to execute it automatically. Uh, you know, I used to work with a, a fund of funds in Singapore that was interested in my volatility strategy before, you know, it had a bout of bad performance. Uh, and so they decided we didn't, they didn't want to work with me anymore. But essentially, they gave me a small little script to say, hey, give us your weights and we'll execute it through a robot. All right. So there probably is some sort of API that goes through an account that, that executes. But the way I execute it, I have to do things manually. Uh, so I would get, you know, uh, I, I would get weights. So like, you know, and in March, I would have gotten this series of weights and I would have had to go to interactive brokers and manually say, okay, if I have $10,000 uh, to invest, then I would have to go and buy $3,351 of SPY, however many shares that is, right? So that's how I do it. It's not, you know, the most correct way. If you were working for an institution, they would have some sort of a routine that says, give me your weights and I will input it into, you know, I will actually execute this in the market in some way. But, you know, that is a whole separate kettle of fish because, you know, there are actual profits to be made from getting better execution. So, uh, but I, I don't know how, how that's done. You know, I do the, you know, what do you buy and sell research as opposed to, you know, how do you buy it, uh, which is a whole different deal. Okay, uh, we actually stay much longer than usual, but does anybody have another question? Uh, so far, no, I don't have, but it was really interesting and great presentation. Thank you, Leah. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Welcome. Yeah, that was okay. great. Thank you. I'm stopping Welcome. the recording.